I got to admit to you here, um, I didn't really understand how this process worked. Okay, I thought it was like the Bugs Life. You guys remember Bugs Life? Where they had a really fat, like, German caterpillar of some sort, and he, like, molted, and then he just came out with wings? That's not what happens. Actually, that caterpillar did not just change. He transformed. They, inside that cocoon, the whole thing turns into some kind of, like, genetic goo that is not... It's the same stuff, but it's really not the same stuff. Like inside of there is not like the guy. It's just goo. And it completely redoes. Now, you guys are all like, yes, we all knew this, Heath. I didn't know this. Okay, so maybe this was just something that I did. But I love the idea of transformation. The Bible word for transformation is metamorphio. And it, it doesn't just mean to be a little bit different. It means to be totally, absolutely transformed totally different so just like that it's a great analogy just like that caterpillar to the butterfly we think it's like the same thing just with wings and we think when what god wants to do with us it's like us but we're just like plus church it's we're the same person we just like plus a little bit of jesus now that's not what god's wanting to do inside of us it's a total complete absolute transformation and that's what we're going to talk about today we're going, to, we're going to dive deep into this in Romans chapter 12 today, and we're going to be talking about transformation and what that means. Now, uh, uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Transformation comes from what we believe, and those beliefs determine what we do. Okay, this is, uh, I got my house on fire. I'll talk about that in a second. People think that it's about what you do, and they, they, they misunderstand church. They misunderstand the gospel, the message. And they think it's about what you do. you got to do different. They think it's like some kind of self-help program about just doing things differently. You just need to do. No, this transformation is actually rooted in our beliefs. And out of the beliefs come the actions. We've been talking about this for several weeks, but this is such an important theological concept that every real Christian's got to know. Because otherwise, we'll just try to pretend we're transformed. We just like strap on little uh, butterfly wings and then make some moves and we're like, look, everybody, I'm different. No, that's not how this works. It actually starts in our beliefs. Okay, I got my little picture of the house on fire. If someone came in late at, late at night into your house, they bust through the door. Well, some, some of us are armed, so that would be bad, but let's just give, play with me here. They bust through the door and they catch me on the couch with the bag of chips watching YouTube or whatever your particular thing is. And I look over, what, what's going on? Your house is on fire. Your house is on fire. I don't see any smoke. I don't see any flames. I don't smell any smoke. Now, the action I'm about to take at that place right there will be determined by my belief, if I believe that person or not. If I don't believe him, I'd be like, dude, you just interrupted my video. And I got even more chip crunchy pieces on me. So off with you. If I do believe him, 
I, I'm going to make an action in correspondence with my belief. I'm going to get up out of the house. I'm going to get my family up out of the house. I'm going to make a change. So don't make it about the actions. Make it about the beliefs. Now, we believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, right? Oh, okay. Those of you online didn't quite maybe catch. There was like four people out of these 200 people that said that. Let's try that again. We believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, right? Yes. Therefore, that belief that we just confessed, we just said, spoke, that belief needs to be something that we have every one of our actions in line with. That would change, because of that belief, that would change every interaction that we would have with every single other person. If Jesus is the Savior of the world, is he their Savior? Yeah. Would they, would they need Jesus? Yeah, they would need Jesus. You see, it would, it would permeate everything from that belief. If you believe that Jesus loves you and has a good path for you, I mean, we believe that, right? Yeah. That his, we believe that his path for us is better than our path for ourselves. And if we believe that, then now it's easy to surrender and say, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to, where do you want me to go? Because all of that is just completely in line with the idea of the, the belief that, that first started. So we go, okay, God, here, here I, the action easily lines up with the belief. So don't get your actions right, get your beliefs right. And even, even look, start questioning your own beliefs. Do I believe that? Yes, I do. What does the Bible say? Let's line our beliefs up with the Word of God. So, okay, as we talk about transformation here, one of the most uh, notable scriptures in the entire Bible about transformation comes from Romans chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Okay, first let's just read this kind of backwards. True and proper worship. Worship is not just the songs we sang this morning. I mean, that was nice. Worship is our whole life. The very life we live is worship to God. Surrender to God. Saying, all right, God, your will be done, not my will be done. And so what is true and proper worship that's found in the living sacrifice part. We're going to go deep into that today. And do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, metamorphio, by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We will know the will of God when we have the transformation that takes place by the way we change our, our thoughts. And this is, a, I mean, you could do a whole sermon series on that verse right there. After Easter, we're doing a sermon series called uh, uh, You Asked For It, where we're going to have, we're going to put out a survey on Easter and see who wants to, and not see, but hopefully you'll fill the thing out and give us a little idea, and we will do the sermon series based upon, like, the main questions that people are asking right now in, in today's culture, Christians are asking. And one of the most uh, common ones is this, what is the will of God? How do I know the will of God? Now, that may or may not end up on, our, on, on the one we end up doing, but I can tell you right now, this is the one I'm asked as a pastor all the time. Because how are we going to know it? We're going to approve, only test and approve it when our mind is renewed. When we're thinking different and we're transformed, it's much easier to find the will of God. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We are not a, uh, an island unto ourselves. We're part of the, the body of Christ. We have different gifts. According to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, serve. If it's teaching, teach. If, if you've been given a gift, we're going to talk about this later too. Man, use that thing. If it's serving, serve. Teaching, teach. If it's to encourage, give encouragement. If it's giving, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Man, that's important. We're not just like, oh, I love you. <laughs> no, truly loving people. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Devoted to one another in love. And honor one another above yourselves. Let's start with this idea. True transformation requires total surrender offer your bodies as a living sacrifice 
total surrender. Okay, sacrifice. You think about that word. If, you, if there was someone that was, if you're, if you're on a battlefield, and, and, and many of, we have uh, many vets here at Heartland, and, you know, thank you for your service. If you, if you were on the battlefield and you, I mean, some, one of your comrades gave up his or her own life so that you could live, that's a sacrifice, an, an unbelievable sacrifice that we, that could go on living. It may, in fact, in America, that we could still have the freedoms that we have. People died to make sure we could continue our lives so their kids and their grandkids could have the American dream. Thank God for that. That was a sacrifice. But the thing about a sacrifice is it's, it's dead. It's gone. In the Old Testament, I have my little picture here. In the Old Testament, they had an altar of sacrifice. They would slaughter the animal, and then they would burn the animal on the altar of sacrifice. Listen, you don't survive the altar of sacrifice. That animal, after being stabbed, ritualistically opened up, things poured out, burned. It's not like, man, that hurt, but I can make it. It's gone. It's gone. So when we're talking about uh, a sacrifice, we're not talking about like a little addition to our lives. When, when we're talking about being a living sacrifice for God, we're not talking about uh, we're just a little different or like I said, we go to church now. We're talking about complete transformation. That caterpillar eats all those leaves. It, its process, if it's uninterrupted, will end up as a butterfly. But it's got to sacrifice its entire life as a caterpillar. Now, I don't know. I've never really talked to one. I don't know which one's easier or harder, the caterpillar life or the butterfly life. But I can tell you, just sitting around eating all the time until I get to where 100 times bigger than I was before, I'm cool with that. <laughs> I'm cool with that. But that caterpillar had to give up all of its understanding, all the legs, all how it got around, its whole understanding of life to be what it would be is if it just stays in the process. And the process is complete transformation. The process is sacrifice. Notice it's, it's a living sacrifice. This isn't some kind of strange suicidal idea. This is we're going to sacrifice the life we're living right now. So instead of going our way, and doing what we want, and going our direction, we're going to go God's direction, and we're going to do what he wants, and we're going to put all our eggs in his basket instead of in our own basket. That's what being a living sacrifice means. Completely, totally surrendered. Every area of your life. Okay, this world, see, it's trying to pressure mold us. Verse 2 goes on to say, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And this, <laughs> this world, see if I can get it right. Suske matizo. Suske matizo to be built after the same pattern. It's pressure molding us. You ever seen where they take those they, they, they have little pellets of plastic, raw plastic, and they put them in this heated press, and they, and all the, between the heat and the pressure, it turns into like a little pail or whatever, a little bucket so you can make a sandcastle. All that is pressure molding. What a great, Suske Matizo, what a great understanding of what the world's trying to do to us. Just pressure molding us putting us in this system everybody looks the same everybody does the same everybody feels the same way about things and how dare you feel some other way man don't you feel like sometimes we're the christians and we're the fish going this way when the whole all the fish are going that way and you're like i want to serve the lord and everybody's like you are an idiot i'm gonna give my life to christ that sounds stupid don't you want to just do what you want to do? No, I want to do what God wants to do. What's wrong with you? Well, that's because there's a pressure mold of what's important in life. A Christian, a believer in Jesus, has a totally different understanding of what's important in life. A totally different value system. We make other people more important. Well, that's not how the world works. The world says, oh, those fish are saying, make yourself the most important thing. Do make sure you're happy because, you know, put yourself first. Make sure, and then we're like, I'm going to help other people. Well, what's wrong with you? I'm going to give money to the church. Well, you now I know you out of your mind. You know, so we got all this pressure. And the, the, tell you what, we're going to refuse to be pressure molded into the things of this world. The Siske Matizo just looking like everybody else. 
No, we are going to decide that we're going to look like Christ. Now, if you got in a time machine, went back 2,000 years, and, and so you're there with, you're looking for Jesus. You know you're in Jerusalem. Somehow they told you that. You're looking for Jesus. You know you'd have a really hard time finding Jesus. I know you're thinking, well, in Easter, he's always got the white robe with the purple sash. That would be how I'd find Jesus because in every single play, right, that's how you know who the Jesus is. Yeah. You know he would have looked the same as everybody else. And if you're like me, you're not going to know Greek or Aramaic the two lang- and probably Hebrew. He would know three languages. Uh, anybody fluent in any of those three? I didn't think so. In other words, you're going to be trying to find Jesus, and you're not going to be able to tell by the way he looks. You're going to have to find him by the way he lives. Right? So please don't make this. Some people try to make this conforming idea like, oh, once you're a Christian, you better get all straight-laced and wear different clothes and cut your hair. I remember Larry, our worship leader, used to have long hair, and uh, somebody told him, I mean, he was like in the ministry, and somebody told him, you know, you need to cut that hair. I mean, this dude's like serving the Lord, worship leading in the church. They basically, you're not a Christian yet until you cut that hair. (laughs) Well, I mean, who cares? But if I could have hair, I would have hair. If I could grow long hair, I would grow long hair. I just don't have any. Amen. People making it about the way you dress and the way you, that's not what, that's not what it's about at all. That's not what conforming to the world looks like. It's talking about our hearts and making sure our hearts are pure and not filled with the selfishness and the self-focus that so easily happens in this world. No, we are refusing to be conformed. Amen? Now, be transformed, verse 2 goes on to say, by the renewing of your mind. Now, these thoughts that come into our head, we can change the direction these thoughts go. Some people don't even realize that they can change the direction your thoughts go. They think that just because a thought went in the head that that's supposed to be there. No, you know, we can actually change the direction that the thoughts go into our head. I mean, sometimes, you know, somebody pulls right out in front of you. That's a wicked thought that went in your head. You should not run them off the road, hurt them, follow them to the grocery store, get out, harass them. And if you do, please don't have like a Heartland sticker on your car or something like that. (laughs) Wear one of them cool new hoodies we got. (laughs) Take that thing off first, please. Okay, because, because just because the thought went through your head doesn't mean you got to do something with that thought. There was a preacher years ago, he had a sermon, and he said, you know, you can't stop the bird from touching your head, but you can stop it from laying and making a nest. You know, so, I mean, the, the, the thought's going to come in there. Some weird thought, some stupid thought the devil's going to try to put in your head, that's going to happen. But we don't have to stop and go, you know what, that's good. Let's just think on that for a while. Yeah, let's just go down that direction and, and, and let that thing just completely consume us. No, we can say, I'm not going that direction. You know what you might need to think about is Jesus and what he did for you. Think about the cross, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, his death, burial, and resurrection. Here we are just a few weeks from Easter. Man, you start putting your mind on those kind of things, guess what? That's where the transformation begins to take place. Don't just let those thoughts sit there. No, man, that's evil, gross stuff. It's not going to help us. It's not going to help us be transformed. We're not going to be caterpillar to butterfly if we continue to think the same way. So God wants us to take those thoughts, and, and it's a whole other sermon really, but take those thoughts captive and steer our thoughts in God's direction. That's where transformation comes. Okay, now moving on. Transformed for what? Transformed to make a difference. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us okay so now we're 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 different we're starting to be different we're starting to live different we start we got to go from this place you're not needed right now i don't know why my phone started talking to me so it's like uh, the ai is finally taking over so transform to make a difference okay we've been given these different gifts Every one of us 
wants to be relevant, uh, wants to not be irrelevant. Let's say it that way. You know, there will be a time when you and I pass away. There will be a time, hopefully it's years and years from now, but there will be a time when we shed this mortal body and we go into heaven and the people here on earth will have the memories of us as what they're clinging onto. And after that period of time, those people that all have memories of us, they'll pass away too. And there will be a time when no one really knows us. No one really knows the memory of us. Thanks, Heath. That's incredibly discouraging. Yes. Wow. Depression. What can we do to not be irrelevant forever? Well, you know what we can do? We can do this right here because God has put a gift inside of every single one of our hearts. Something, a charis, charis is the word used here. It's a grace. It's not, if, if you get a birthday gift to your kid, you, 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 you're not, they didn't earn it. It's because we love them. God put something at the moment of conception. He put something inside of you, gifts inside of you. And those gifts are made to make a difference that will actually change the eternals, the whole way the eternity works. But we've got to find out what these things are. We've been given them, and we'll talk about that in a second. We've got to find out what they are and use them. Because that's the only thing that actually lives on. The stuff that we do that God's called us to do, that he's placed exactly in our hearts. Now, we do have a few of these gifts, but what I've noticed is when you take a step, I'm going to call it a small step. You take a small step into those gifts, God opens up the next present for you. Like he's got them in a closet or something. He, they're there, they're inside of you, but you've got to kind of do this one to get that one, and you've got to kind of take a step, a small step. God will never reveal the whole plan for us. That's what we want. We want God to show us, okay, God, where is the end goal here? You know what? He actually will not show us the end goal. What he does instead is he says, take this step. And we're like, well, what does this step have to do with the take this step? But, Lord, I don't understand how this is going to lead to take this step. And then we take it, and it doesn't look connected at all to the greater reality, but it unlocks the next thing to, so we can get to where God wants us to be. So we got to take that small step. For me, I was uh, 12 years old, and I started to play drums. I'd love to say I wanted to play drums for the Lord. I wanted to play drums because the girls thought it was cool. So, uh, this is so very humble of me. And so I was playing drums, and then we didn't have a drummer at the church. This is the early years of, of our church here. And we didn't have a drummer, so I started playing drums for the church using the thing that God gave me. Now, I still practiced a lot, but there was a certain amount of aptitude. It came, it came to me. So I was playing drums. I, I was happy playing drums. That was cool. I, didn't, I never thought I would be doing what I'm doing right now this exact second this was never on the radar like never I wasn't like seven years old or something like I want to be a preacher my, my dad was one of those I was like please God don't make me do that but instead but instead I just took a step started playing drums the next thing you know that I, matter of fact I had preached probably a, a handful of messages before I realized that this is what God wanted me to do I mean, I was like, I was already doing it. And I'm like, they're like, you should do this. I'm like, no, <laughs> what? That's what you should do. <laughs> because one, I was, and, I, and from the bottom of my heart, I would be just as happy being the drummer at our church as I am being the, the preacher here. Okay, I mean, seriously, there's maybe even happier. But I, I was, <laughs> was going to say, I'm not doing this because of some power trip. I'm doing this because it's the way that God's asked me to serve and use what God's put in my life to put something that lasts forever into the hearts of other people. But I'd be just as happy being the drummer doing that. And it'd make just as much of an impact. We all have these different gifts. And not only that, God created us to need each other. You were created to not have all that you need to get to where you're going. Did you catch that? You were created on purpose to not have all you need to get to where you're going. In other words, if you're like, I just can't seem to pull it off, exactly. You cannot pull it off in our own strength or even our own gifts. We have to have each other. I mean, even if I was going to be a teaching pastor, which like right now, but there was nobody in the room and nobody watching online, or, well, that's pretty lame. 
go away, do something else. We have to have each other. Each of us has to take a small step. And the key is servanthood. Nothing transforms us quite like serving others. See, once again, we're talking about being transformed. Everybody else is going this way. It's all about them and what they can do. And here we are saying, I'm going to make it about somebody else. How powerful that is in today's society is to make it about somebody else. Man, that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So what do I mean by serving other people? Servanthood. I mean, it's, even the word sounds like I'm below. And yeah, it's saying I'm going to put somebody else as the priority, just like Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 10 said. I'm going to make someone else the key, the goal. I'm going to make something else the point. Our church is rooted in servanthood. Matter of fact, every one of our pastors started out serving somewhere long before they were ever in the ministry. None of them were like, all right, I just came in here with this special degree, and I've got this degree, and here I go. Let's be in the ministry. All of them were like in the kids' ministry, helping out in different places, moving chairs. That's what we all did. And then, see, with that spirit of servanthood came, okay, how can I best serve? And they took one small step, and that lead, led to another small step, and that led to another small step. Now you get to where I'm saying. It wasn't like, oh, you know, it's a start out in this place. No. And even now, I mean, you'll, we're not a, I'm not afraid of moving a chair or doing a thing or helping fix a toilet. Now, it's not in my gifting, and I'll do you a favor and hand you the tool like a little kid. That's about what level of skill I have. But I'm there, and I want to help. And may we always keep that same, all of us keep that same servanthood spirit, making it about others, because in the power of that, this is where the Lord's at. See, he washed the feet of those disciples. We're here headed towards the Easter season. That the washing the feet was showing how he was saying it's all about serving someone else. Servanthood, the power of servanthood. The power in washing and towel and all of that and saying, you know what, I am about you and helping you get to where God wants you to be. So guys, how do we apply this to our lives? Here we are. Two things, steer your thoughts back to God and take a small step in using the gifts God placed in you. First, your thoughts, sending them back to the Lord. Just say, no, I'm not going to think on that garbage. I'm not going to think on that stuff. I'm going to think on what God wants me to think on. I'm going to make sure my thoughts are headed towards the Lord's direction. And then here, take a small step in using the gifts. We have, after church today, actually, Pastor Glenn, will you hand that to me? After church today, we've got this spiritual gifts assessment. It's a, it's a pretty cool little tool. You take some, you ask some questions. It asks you some questions, probably takes 10 minutes to fill out, and it just kind of gets you started to say, all right, this is some areas that you may want to try to find to take that step. But let me tell you, it j just take a small step. You don't have to take a big step. I'm telling you, the little one unlocks the next one, unlocks the next one, but, but, but I believe everybody needs to be taking a small step today because God wants to use you. And we want to get to heaven and look back and God show us that little thing you did that you thought was inconsequential, you did that in my name and you did that and that led to this and that led to this and this person's now in heaven because of what you just did. And see, when you said that, you thought, well, that didn't go over well. You, you spoke the truth and that unlocked this and this person's now in heaven right now because you said that and it started off a chain, a domino effect of serving the Lord and, and there are going to be whole people coming up to us saying, you have no idea, but what you did in this small thing in the name of Jesus changed everything. But all that takes place by taking this small step in God's direction. For all those online, this thing can be found online. It's called a Spiritual Gifts Test, and we'll help you find that. Uh, online, Pastor Mark will we'll help you find that. But for every one of us, let's take a step today. Let's make sure that for, for us, our beliefs are this way and we have an action in lining up with said beliefs, right? If I could have every head bowed, please, and every eye closed, we're going to pray. Let's take a little moment here. First off, I want to pray for anybody that's been tormented with thoughts 
and, and not just one or two, we're talking like a lot of thoughts. The devil's been tormenting you. And I don't, I don't know what those thoughts are, but I just, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit wants us to pray for those people right now. I believe that's somebody here in this room. Lord, we pray right now. Lord, we pray right now for those that are tormented right now in their thoughts. Thoughts of their past, thoughts of mistakes they've made, thoughts of things that have uh, they've not gone correctly. The, the, the devil's tormenting them. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, together we pray. We break the chains of, that, of those thoughts in Jesus' mighty name. Freedom, freedom, freedom in every single person's thoughts today, Lord. Devil, you're broken and you're bound. You have no authority in our life. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Fill our minds with, with the, the Word of God and the things of God. I want to pray right now for people that you don't know what step to take. In Isaiah, the book of Isaiah starts out and, and God calls him and, and basically God looks out over the planet and God's looking for somebody. And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And I pray that same spirit be on every one of our hearts. That, Lord, we don't even know where you're sending us. We don't even know what you got for us. But our hearts are the hearts of Isaiah. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Send me. Use us and send us. If that's you today, I don't want to ask, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but just agree with me in prayer here today. You're like, yes, Lord, I want to be used by you. We pray out every single one of us here together that wants that in our hearts, Lord. We pray that together right now in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, use us, Lord. Show us what to do. Help us take that small step so that we can make a difference, Lord. We got Easter coming up, Jesus. Lord, if there's something you want us to do to reach somebody, tell us what that is, Lord. I pray for an obedience upon every single one of us, me, every single one of us, that, Lord, we do as you ask us to do. We do as you call us to do. Lord, we may not be a big church, Lord, but we can be an obedient church. We may not be a mega church, Lord, but we can be a great church that loves God, loves people, and serves people. Let that be us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.